Ladies and gentlemen, family and friends, scholars and dignitaries, welcome to another episode. Welcome to my world. Hello friends. So this is a short video, but it certainly could be a very powerful video depending on what your goals are and the assets and strengths you bring to the table. And believe me, while it may not seem to be important to you now, this is one of those dynamics that becomes more important related to our age. The older we get, the more important it becomes. I wasn't born rich, nor did I ever achieve that. In fact, I grew up, like many families, in what is known as relative poverty until I was able to get student loans and go to college. Anyway, there are a lot of people who want to know the secret formula for either getting rich or at least having the ability to live a comfortable life. You know, pay your mortgage, pay your bills, support your family, and have a few dollars left to go out for dinner once in a while or to go on a summer vacation. And to begin, that's how I define wealth. It's not necessarily being rich beyond belief, but it really is having the money you need so that with proper spending and allocation, with proper budgeting, you're not living in a high-stress life, a life of constant tension, a life where you're really barely living and constantly behind on your debts and bills. Now, before we begin, I just want to say that to a great degree, you need to follow one of the basic laws of life, and that is, quote, what you put into life is what you get out of life. And with this in mind, generally speaking, if you follow these five simple rules overall, over a period of time, like 10 or 15 years, you will build a level of wealth that you will come to appreciate. This is not some prosperity gimmick or magical thinking. It's pretty much common sense, but it's amazing how many people neglect even these little things. And these are things that can set you back big time in terms of financial independence. And here's just one example. The biggest waste of money is when people spend their precious, hard-earned money on alcohol, on tobacco, on drugs, and on gambling. These are all so expensive and a complete waste of money and tends to keep people not just poor, but in a cash deficit position and behind on their normal bills and expenses. For instance, cigarettes are $10 a pack, and I knew one man that was actually a five-pack-a-day smoker. So just start to work those numbers up and you'll see what I mean. And one person I know bought a hundred lotto cards every week, again, spending his hard-earned money for nothing. And the same is true for all these little vices, even going out to dinner at expensive restaurants, all the while spending our precious dollars on very expensive habits. So, of course, one of the first things to remember is to not waste your money on trivial, unnecessary items. And in that regard, you're saving your nickels and dimes, and that will soon translate into dollars. So, the first role of wealth is to prepare a written budget and to review that budget every day for a minimum of three months and to keep to that budget for that period without exception. When you examine a budget that you've created, there is an inherent tendency to be more motivated to keep to it. And when you do it for only 30 days, it becomes a new habit, a new way of money allocation that becomes second nature to you. And by the end of the third month, it becomes an automatic feature in your skills of daily living. Budgeting is a must. It is necessary for you to prepare your own monetary plan, but then to stick to it for at least one month at a time. And of course, you can modify that budget as you need to for the future month, but prepare your budget to the best of your ability. Oh, and so you know, every successful business operates in a tight budget, and resource allocation and management is often the primary reason why most businesses either succeed or fail. The second role of wealth is that you need to get out of debt as soon as possible. And believe me, swimming in debt will sink you faster than anything. Now, some analysts will tell you to work with other people's money rather than spend your own. But here's one of the greatest examples to show why this isn't true. If you buy a house for $200,000, you will pay $200,000 for that house. But if you mortgage a $200,000 house over 30 years at 7% interest, you are paying back $480,000 or about $280,000 just in interest to that bank. That's an extra $280,000 of your hard-earned money paid to the bank. That's what debt is. You are working for the bank. 
and credit card debt is far worse than home mortgages. Credit cards have adjustable rates for interest. So many are now at 20%, and I've actually seen them as high as 50%. That means only half of your payment goes on the principal you owe. Again, the average credit card debt in America is about $10,000 per family. And when you add in both the interest and the delinquency fees for late payments, you're paying a hefty sum to the bank. Again, you're working for the bank. So when they say that the borrower is slave to the lender, the truth is that they aren't that far off. Pay off your debts, even if it means buying fewer or cheaper goods for a longer period of time paying your highest interest debts first, making extra payments, and make a decision not to go into debt. Oh, and one more example. Instead of a new car payment, if you take that $500 a month and invest it from age 30 to age 70 in a decent growth stock mutual fund, you'll have $5.6 million at age 70. That's the real cost of what a car payment is to you. Third, surround yourself with like-minded people. We all need support systems, and the fact is that we do tend to grow like those around us. So if we hang out with people that go shopping every day, all day, go out and eat all the time, drink a lot, or go to the casinos or out for expensive entertainment, then we will too. And thus, our money will be dribbled away slowly but steadily. But if we hang out with people who tend to be conservative, people who are savers, who tend to entertain at home, then we will probably do so as well. Yes, we need relationships, but be sure that they are beneficial relationships and not toxic relationships, at least for where your wealth and assets are concerned. The fourth principle is one of the most important. A primary difference between people of affluence and people in debt is that the wealthy save and invest. Generally speaking, wise people underspend and save their money, especially for an emergency. And then when something happens, something legitimate like new tires for a car or a new roof for the house, instead of borrowing and going into debt, they have a reserve ready to accommodate any unexpected emergencies. And that's the key. They both save their money as a reserve for the unexpected, but as important, they invest their money and have it start working for them. So be sure to do both. Save your money and put some into a reserve account for those unexpected emergencies that always happen. And trust me, they always happen, and it's a good thing to have a reserve fund to be able to pay for them instead of borrowing and going into debt. But even more importantly, take some and invest it into a retirement fund, into stocks or bonds, or other financial vehicles. Make your money work for you and watch it grow over the years. And the fifth principle of wealth is perhaps the most overlooked. This last principle is about charity. Be charitable. Charity is making a donation, a generous donation, to the poor, the sick, the hungry, widows or orphans, or to any organization that serves those in need. Now, this may seem to be in direct conflict with what we're talking about. We're saying reduce unnecessary spending, save your money, and invest it to make it work for you. But... Charity is an investment. It's an investment for the greater good of our neighbors and the community at large. And it goes toward a good cause, to help the poor and sick, the unfortunate, to get back on their feet. Oh, and one more point. It is actually investing in yourself in more ways than one. One of my observations is that at some point in their lives, everyone, and I mean everyone, will have to turn to some organization for help. And those organizations are only there because others were charitable in helping to sponsor them. I don't care if it's a dollar or $10,000. A healthy and functional society needs charitable work and charitable support for those less fortunate. Be charitable. So, of course, this is the general outline for a program of building wealth. And there are a thousand variations on this. Do you really need this purchase? Remember the adage? wants versus needs and if you don't need it don't buy it can you find a less expensive alternative often stores overcharge by 70 or 80 percent to increase their profit margin but maybe by buying an off-brand name you can save 50 percent 
Do you have a financial planner, a professional who can help you put together even a minimal plan that can begin to earn and accrue over time? And have you really looked at ways you can cut spending, utilities, cable television, or by remembering the environmental rules, reduce, reuse, and recycle? So again, building wealth is not a gimmick and it isn't an event. It won't happen overnight. It's a lifetime plan of working and saving and investing, but investing in yourself and in your family, and ultimately, that investment will pay off. And finally, if it helps, remember that true wealth is not about having a lot of money. It's about having just enough to pay your bills and support your family, because the real wealth is right there in your family. And people who have gratitude for what they do have understand that. Hey, be safe, be well, and may God bless you and your family.